thank you. And now, <laughs> Jacqueline Woodson, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's been an honor. Each kindness makes the whole world a little bit better. That line is from a book I wrote many years ago, but this week, again and again, I was reminded of what first inspired me to write it. There is a kindness here in Sweden. I learned it over the past week, my first time in this country. As I visited the young people at schools in Stockholm and Vemmaby, as I sat down with journalists, had fika with artists and illustrators, ate really good pizza with the amazing Alma Jewelry in Astrid Lindgren's Stockholm apartment, drank wine with black and Latino and Persian young Swedes, sat in public conversations with academics and middle school teachers, drove the roads of this country with my patient and kind driver, Gert, laughed with my amazingly wonderful taskmaster, Helen, ate lunch with relatives and friends in Astrid's childhood home, dinner with more relatives and friends at Astrid Lindgren's world, received hugs and flowers and books and paintings from children and grown-ups. What I felt again and again was the deep kindness of a country and a people. Sometimes you don't know how much you missed the thing until it returns to you. In the U.S., we've been living beneath a cloud so thick and gray with unkindness that some days it feels like a long winter has come up, has taken up per permanent residence. And I don't mind North American winters, and I'm not going to complain to you Swedes about winter. <laughs> really, I don't mind it. It gives one a chance to rest, to slow down, to plan for springtime, to gain perspective. So I like to think that that's what's happening in my country. As young people lead the resistance, I am seeing a country at the fiery stages of fear and rebirth. Just like with the civil rights movement of the 1960s, I am seeing people lose their lives and march and fight and speak out against hate. And it is scary, and it is hard, and it is exhausting. But more than all of these things, it is necessary. To get to kindness, to get to safety for all people, we must first and foremost not be afraid to speak out against a country's wrongdoings. And above, you notice that I write the word gray to describe the time we are living in in the U.S. I do not write, it is a dark time, it is a black time. As a child, every time I saw words like dark and black being used to describe something negative, I winced, I am dark, I am black. Why should who I am be negative? It is something we must think about always, whether we are writers or not. What are the words we are using and how are we using them? Who do we hurt and who do we heal? As a writer, I not only think about language, but about the many, many people who will read my words and what mirrors of themselves they will see in those words. I never want a young person walking away from my work feeling lesser than or wrong somehow. I never want a young person to see the color of their skin used to refer to something evil. So yes, in the U.S. and in so much of the world, as the alt-right seems to gain power, as civil rights laws get repealed, as women's bodies and brown bodies and immigrant bodies are constantly threatened, as unjust laws once again separate brown children from their parents, first via enslavement, then via mass incarceration, and now via deportation laws. Let us keep remembering that like every great children's book ever written, you can't have sadness without hope. Astudy showed us this. There must always be a brightness at the center of that which feels so difficult. And with that, and with that which is difficult comes a call to action. Tonight is a glorious evening, and I'm so grateful to be here. But tomorrow, I get back to work. As I move through this country this week, again and again, I'm reminded that first and foremost, we must remain kind. That kindness, the kindness of family and friends and strangers, has gotten us, has gotten so many of us 
through hard times. When the phone rang that very, very early morning in March, my partner and I didn't hear it, thankfully. <laughs> it was on another floor in our house, and even our hypervigilant dogs slept through it. When it rang again, maybe someone steered, stirred, dreaming of a phone ringing somewhere. But when it rang the third time, my partner was up. It was around 6, 18, uh, 6 a.m., and hearing her speaking into it, I jumped up. A phone ringing at, ringing at the crack of dawn is rarely good news. I quickly went through my mind asking the questions, who has been sick, were both children at home, had anyone we'd known taken a car trip in the middle of the night? Juliet, my partner on the other hand, thought it was our daughter calling from two floors up to ask us to turn up the heat. <laughs> the thermostat is on our floor, and in the cold months, we get this call often. You may ask, well, why doesn't your child just walk down the stairs and turn up the heat herself? <laughs> but if you're asking that question, you are not a parent to a teenager. <laughs> but when Julia handed the phone to me and an accident voice asked, is this Jacqueline Woodson? I exhaled, no tragedy. Tragedy didn't come via the name Jacqueline Woodson. And as my half-asleep brain raced around wondering what or who or why, the voice said, this is Helen Singlin. I'm calling you from Bologna to let you know you're this year's recipient of the Astrid Lindgren Award. Of course, I'm probably paraphrasing this because remember the half-asleep thing. <laughs> then she asked if I knew about this prize. What came to mind was Pippi Longstocking. And I think that's what comes to most American minds because Astrid Lindgren wasn't published wasn't translated when I was a young person, aside from those stories. I knew that there was an award. I know that some people had won it. I didn't know, though, that I was even in the running for it. It's been a bit of a crazy year in the US. But of course, I had heard of the award. I didn't tell Helen that as I was talking to her, I was going upstairs to my computer to Google as the Lingen Award. <laughs> And then I think I probably used an American colloquialism that I won't repeat on stage. <laughs> then for the next three hours, as the information sank in, I answered call after call after call from the Swedish press. Slowly, maybe over a period of weeks, I became the Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award Laureate. And for this, I say thank you. To the amazing jury that cho chose me, to the people of Sweden, who have been so kind to the crown princess who has presented me with this honor tonight, to my family who trekked all the way from New York City, my geeky kids complaining about us making them miss school again, <laughs> to share this moment with me, to the Minister of Democracy and Culture, thank you, to Astrid Lindgren, for her own deep respect of young people and for the value of their narratives. But mostly, I say thank you to the young people themselves, who each day give me a reason to keep on writing, who th through their own strength, bravery, and perseverance show me the importance of the work I'm doing and all the work I still have left to do. Thank you. Thank you.